listening to today's Community Cast. My name is Matt Morgan. I'm the pastor at Community Brookside, a new church plant in Tulsa, Oklahoma. We are so blessed by your presence, and we hope that today's content will bring you joy. So last week, uh, my very good friend, Andy Henson, who you got to meet last week, uh, came to our church and he shared a little bit about his heart for what the invitation of Jesus looks like, that invitation to a life of peace and rest. And he reminded us that Christ doesn't want us to just be burdened beyond what we can handle and what we can bear, that Jesus wants the best for us. One thing that I want us to remember is that although Christ does desire the best for us, although he promises us a life of peace and rest, a life that is freer and a life that is lighter, getting to that point is not going to be easy. As a matter of fact, we have talked repeatedly in church about how following Jesus is not for the faint of heart. Following Jesus is actually a pretty hard thing to do. Being a Christian is, is one of the hardest things that we can seek to become. But the reward of that search, the reward of our faith is far better than anything we could even imagine. So as a reminder of that gift that Jesus is for us, Pastor Andy read last week from the book of Matthew in chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. And I want to read the message, the version that he read to us last week, because I think it's beautiful. You can follow along on the screen. It says this, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Can I get an amen on some of that? Jesus says, come to me, get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. This is a promise from the mouth of Jesus. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Freer and lighter is the promise of Jesus, but the caveat is, did you hear that in the first part of the scripture? Keep company with me. That's the caveat. We have to keep company with Jesus, and that doesn't mean that we get to just be associated with Jesus. It's not about you know, spending just a little bit amount of time with Jesus, keeping company with Jesus actually means we have to spend some quality time with Jesus. Jesus wants us to spend time with him intentionally, not once a week on a Sunday morning at 11 o'clock, but be with Jesus, spend time with Jesus, keep company. Jesus is telling us, ready? The savior of the world God's incarnate son is telling us he wants to spend time with us. So parents, I'm going to ask you a question. So those of you who have a little bit older parents, or sorry, older kids, uh, how often do you have to tell your students or your children to put away their phones, right? Okay, so there's, there's some agreement in the room. Teachers, who's a teacher in here? Quite a few. How many times do you have to tell your students to put crap away that they're not, so they're not focused on something else, right? It's an everyday situation. I mean, if we can count a number, what would that number be? A million, two million, three million times a day, right? It seems like it. Friends, how often do you have to take the phone out of your friend's hand so they will make direct eye contact with you when you're trying to have a conversation, right? Married couples. That's a thing that we do sometimes, right? Look at my face. None of that is quality time. And Jesus is talking about quality time when he says he wants us to spend time with him. He's not telling us that he wants us to pretend that we're interested in him. He's not telling us that he wants us to just be in the same room doing something else. Jesus wants our undivided, fully focused attention on him in order for us to truly get to know who he is. I looked up what the definition of keeping company is. Now, do you realize if you type in, type in Google like a phrase, you can put in define and then the phrase, and it will define those things for you. Like I just thought it was kind of the one word situation, like the dictionary, you have to look up that one word. But no, you could type in whole phrases. That's life changing for me. <laughs> keeping company means to spend time with one for the sake of companionship or in order to keep them from being lonely. 
What a great definition that is, right? So this is implying that Jesus needs us to be with him so that he's not lonely. Keep company with me. Jesus says, I don't want to be alone without you. I want you with me. Jesus is lonely without us. That's a big deal. Think about that for a minute. Jesus needs each one of us to spend as much time with him as we can for companionship. He doesn't say, I want to treat you like a subordinate. He doesn't say, I want to treat you like you're less than. Be my companion. Be somebody who walks beside me. Without each one of us, Jesus is incomplete. Just like without Jesus, each one of us is incomplete. When we get to spend some intentional time with Christ, we are promised a life that is lived more freely and more lightly. That's what we talked about all week last week. But getting to that point of living that life takes work. And sometimes being a Christian is filled with obstacles. So last week, Andy asked a question to you guys. And the question was, do we do things that actually allow us to keep company with Jesus? Do we do things that actually allow us to keep company with Jesus? Guys, we're all busy, right? We fill our moments from the moment we get up until the moment we go to bed with things, don't we? And sometimes it's not easy to be intentional about spending time with Jesus. That question has been rolling around in my mind since last week. Do I actually do things that allow me to keep company with Jesus? Do you? I don't want Jesus to be lonely, right? Are we willing to do the work that leads us to a life of freedom and light? How many of you have parents? Good, good, good job. It was a test, most of you passed. All right, so when I was growing up, my dad was full of parent wisdom and also bad dad jokes. Um, but like most dads, sometimes his good advice was actually really good advice. One of the pieces of advice that he gave me applies to this particular situation. We're talking about um, the relationship that we have with Jesus. We're going to have to give a little bit in order to have the full potential of that relationship. He says to me, son, sometimes it takes money to make money. You ever heard that before? Yeah? The literal meaning of that little nugget of wisdom is that in order for you to create something of value, it's going to take an investment on your part. For instance, if you're trying to build a company from scratch, it's going to take a huge investment of time and of money. If you want to run a successful lemonade stand, which you guys should hear me, this is good business advice for your lemonade stands. If you're going to run a successful lemonade stand, you need to buy good lemons. You have to buy the best filtered quality water that you can find. You're going to need to pay to create a recognizable brand so that people can tag you on the social medias. You need to buy cups that are just the right size so that people feel like they're getting a good value for their money. You need to buy high quality clear ice, probably the Sonic Ice. Like we know, we know that we love a little crunchy Sonic Ice. It's the best. You have to spend money investing in your business in order to make money on the back end. So for those of you who did not know this, my wife, Nicole, she's back in the back. Hi, Nicole. Um, Nicole started her own business a few years ago, and she invested a ton of her own time into it. So that meant that she didn't have much free time for a lot of anything else. That also meant long nights at the office. It meant spending lots of money on coffee shops and even having to leave our family vacation sometimes a little bit early in order to put out fires. She's not a firefighter. She's not literally putting out fires, but there are fires in a company that sometimes you're the only one that can put out. It also meant that when she started her own company that we had to literally spend money in order for her to make money. This meant we had to make some financial decisions like I used to drive a really cool 2007 Hyundai Tiburon SE with a V6 and a six-speed transmission in a vivid blue metallic. It was a cool car, one of the coolest cars I've ever owned. But in order for us to start her business, that meant that we had to make some sacrifices. And I actually sold that car and gave the cash for that car to my wife so she could open her business. I went from driving that beautiful Tiburon to a 1994 Chevy S10, right? That's a huge difference, going from a sport car 
to a, kind of a beat up old pickup truck. But that investment paid off. It took an investment from each of us to make Nicole's business as successful as it's become. It takes money to make money. In the same way, it takes an investment on our part in order for us to live a life of freedom and light that Jesus promises us. And one of the ways that we need to make that investment is by bearing the right burdens that having a faith in Jesus brings. Jesus knows that following him is going to be hard. In Scripture, on multiple occasions, he tells us that pretty clearly. One example of this is found in the book of Luke, chapter 14. You can follow along on the screen. In verses 25 through 35, it says this. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to finish it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is neither fit for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Ouch. That's a big commitment. Jesus in this moment is telling us that our love for him is going to have to make every other relationship that we have, our families, our friends, every other commitment that we have besides Jesus is going to have to look like hate because we love Jesus that much. That's weird to think about. Our commitment to Jesus is going to make Everything else, our spouses, our best friends, our children, look like we don't really care about them because our, our pinnacle of care is for Jesus. When Jesus tells us that we have to hate our mothers and our fathers, our wives and our children, he's telling us that by comparison, his love should exceed that. That's how closely we're invited to follow Jesus. That we love him more than anything. And that's hard because I really love my wife and I really love my kids but Jesus has to be more for us. Jesus talks about the king who goes against another king. He talks about us building a foundation. He talks about us, th those particular things in order to tell us that we've got to be prepared for the journey that we're going to lead. If we're not ready for it, we're going to get in over our heads and we're not going to be able to complete the journey. He's telling us that we better know what we're getting ourselves into so that we don't stop short in our discipleship. We are expected not just to put Jesus and his message first, but also to carry our crosses daily in order to follow him. And now, at this time, Jesus hadn't been crucified yet. It takes on a whole different meaning when Jesus literally has to carry a cross to the place where he was going to die. We have to follow the example of Jesus, even if it means our death. He's warning us that in order for us to get to the place where we're closest to him, where we can receive this promised freedom and light, we're going to be challenged. We're going to deal with adversity. We're going to come up against people who don't like us. We may have to sacrifice a lot of things in order to receive that promise. The promise of Jesus doesn't come without a cost. And the sad thing is that we've turned the power of that statement into something that's kind of, kind of super weak in our faith today, right? Jesus isn't telling us in this moment that we're going to have to pick up our jewel-encrusted 14-karat gold crosses and put them around our neck. He's not telling us that we're going to have to put a little bumper sticker on the back end of our car. Jesus in the scripture is telling us that we have to be willing to follow him even to our very death, if need be. And we don't sacrifice anything by putting a sticker on our windshields, right? 
We don't sacrifice anything by putting the little fish on the back of our car. We don't sacrifice anything at all when we wear a t-shirt that has Philippians 4.13. That's not making a sacrifice. Jesus, Jesus is telling us that we have to be willing to go to the cross ourselves in order to follow his example fully. And listen, I don't think we have to be worried about a cross literally anymore. We live in a country where we are free to worship God. So I don't think we're going to have to worry about a cross, but sometimes we're going to stick up for righteousness and justice, and it's going to feel like we're being crucified. Sometimes we're going to speak for somebody who can't speak for themselves, and it's going to feel like we're the ones being nailed to a tree. And guess what? Even in those moments of hurt, in those moments of pain, even in those moments where we feel like we're laying our own necks out on the line, we've got to do it because we've been called to it. We have to follow the example of Jesus, and that example led him to the cross. So are we willing to sacrifice the things that we like? Are we willing to lay down our own desires, our own lives, to live like Jesus told us how to live and showed us? So let me ask you a question, friends, and I want to hear you. Do you believe that the promise of Jesus, of this life that's freer and lighter, is worth it? Do you believe that the promise of Jesus is worth the cost? I'm sorry, what? Do you, though? So the follow-up question then has to be, are you willing to do what it takes to receive that life of freeness, this life of light? Are you willing to give up the pleasures of the world in order to receive a life that has a longer-term return on that investment? Guys, the Bible is full of stories of men and women who have given up their privilege, their power for the sake of Jesus, people who left their previous lives in order to follow Christ closer, people like the disciples who left their lives what they knew as fishermen, people like Zacchaeus who had to quit cheating people as he was robbing them during tax collection season, people like Stephen who were unafraid even in the courts of people to preach about the life-changing gift of the sacrifice of Christ. As we've talked about before, the Apostle Paul is one of the greatest examples of what it sometimes looks like for us to have faith, for us to be people who follow Jesus. Once he met Jesus for the very first time, he changed everything about who he was. He went from persecuting the church to being a disciple of Jesus and bringing the church to places the church had never been before. He spread the gospel in a way that was powerful and it was mighty. And almost half of our New Testament are things that the Apostle Paul wrote because his theology was solid. He lived his life daily as a sacrifice for Jesus because he wanted that, that life that Jesus promised. So a couple of weeks ago when we were in our previous sermon series, we talked about what it looked like to follow Jesus and we talked about what Paul wrote in the book of 2 Corinthians. I want to read this to you again. You've heard it before and you'll hear it again. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, it says this, Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from the Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I do not feel weak? Who is led to sin and I do not inwardly burn? If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and the Father of the Lord Jesus, who is to be praised forever, knows that I'm not lying. Can you do it, guys? Holy cow, that is a huge list of painful, awful things that Paul endured in order to show the world who Jesus was. And we can't even be civil to one another now, right? We can't even go online right now and just be people after the heart of Jesus because everything's a fight. Paul's journey was exceptionally hard because he fearlessly spoke about the power that only Jesus brings, the power that challenged the rulers of his day 
And Paul ended up paying the ultimate price. He was beheaded, right? Even on what would be considered Paul's deathbed, right? He was in jail. Paul was at peace. He continued to write to the churches that he founded about the love of Jesus because he, he had no fear. He knew that the life that Jesus promised wasn't just for this life, but it was for all eternity. The great news is that promise is a both. It is for here and now and also forever. We can have a life that is free and light. Even throughout all of these struggles, even though he would eventually give his life for his faith, he knew the promise of Jesus was worth the sacrifice. And so do you believe that the promise of Jesus is worth giving up a few things for? I cannot speak enough about how the faith that people say they profess now looks nothing like the faith of Jesus. And it's hard because Jesus didn't call us to come and sit every Sunday and just for an hour a week and participate in faith. Jesus called us to something bigger where we have to look around this room and care for one another. When we have to go outside these doors, we look around the world and find ways that we can show the love of Jesus everywhere we are. And that's hard. And so we just stopped doing it. That can't be the church of the 21st century. It's not going to survive. So there's this beautiful promise of a freer and lighter life. There's a cost to getting to that point. Having a true faith is not easy and it comes with requirements. For us to receive the promises of Christ, we have to pattern our own lives after the life of Jesus. And he tells us about this. Actually, Paul tells us about this in the book of Romans in chapter 12. I want to read this to you. It's a little bit long, but it's worth the read. It says this, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. What? Holy and pleasing to God. Do I have to? And then he says, this is your true and proper worship. Offering our bodies as a holy living sacrifice and living in mercy. He goes on, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good pleasing and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. What? But rather think of yourselves with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. That in itself is really hard, right? Putting others first. Verse four, for just as each one of you has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, we, throw, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the graces given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. We are called to different things. Do those things. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Holy crap, this list is long. Verse 14, bless those who persecute you. Nope, I'm out. <laughs> bless and do not curse. What? Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. 
Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it's mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, listen to this. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If your enemy is thirsty, give her something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not become, do, sorry, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, are you ready to go and do all that? That's hard. This list, it just seems like it just keeps going. We can't even be nice to one another anymore. Paul tells his readers in the other church, in the early church, and he's also telling us that all of these things apply to every day that we live. Our acts of self-sacrifice are our true and perfect ways to worship God. Our acts of self-sacrifice are the true and proper way that we worship God. Here is fun, here is good, here is convenient and easy. We all drive and we get the donuts and we get the coffee and we hear great music and a terrible tambourine and we get to spend some time here together with one another and it's lovely and it's great, but that's not true worship. This is a piece of something much bigger. Our worship is the way that we treat one another because every person we meet, whether we believe it or not, whether we agree with them or not, they are created in the image of God. That's how we worship God, by loving our neighbor as ourselves. We are also told that we're expected to not look like everyone else. That instead, we as people of the cross have to look like Jesus. Paul tells us that when we see the world through the eyes of Jesus, we're going to be able to see the perfect will of God. And we're going to be able to join in in that movement for our world. He then begins to tell us that each one of us are going to be able to join in God's movement because he has gifted us differently. Some of you are going to be great teachers. Others are going to be prophets. Others are going to sing great. Others are going to, again, play the tambourine, and you shouldn't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But God has gifted every single one of us with something different that we have to offer the church, the collective whole, to better our world. If God has called you to be a prophet, be a prophet. Don't try to do something else. If you know that God has gifted you with the ability to sing, sing. If God has called you to teach, do it. Our gifts are unique to us, and we're called to use those gifts to be the church that changes the world with the love of Jesus. And then Paul goes on to spend the rest of the chapter telling us that we're to be a force for good. The most important part of our faith has to be about serving others, putting others' needs first. Did you hear that repeatedly? Think of others. Don't be conceited. Don't be proud. Put the needs of other people before yourself. Guys, that's not America today, right? That's not who we are anymore. We are not living out our faith. And it's time for us to get that back because the church loses its power when we're all about us, right? If you're like me, then you see the stories in the news where Christians are being and acting in a way that doesn't look like Jesus and that doesn't care for neighbor. I've seen the Christian flag in rallies I've heard the Bible pulled out of context to justify all kinds of evils. I've seen people who identify as Christians care only for themselves and neglect their duty to be transformed by their faith, and instead, they look like everybody else. And that's not who we're called to be. We have to be the very presence of goodness in the world around us. And none of it is easy. But if we want to live that promised life of freedom and light, then we have a responsibility as the people of the cross to accept the full invitation of Jesus to something different. Jesus called the people in the ancient world to be different than the people around them. And he calls us to do the same thing right now. Our world is almost an exact mirror to what the world of Jesus looked like 2,000 years ago. 
when people were concerned with themselves, concerned with their own ideas and their own agendas, and they weren't concerned about the poor and the unfortunate and those who are broken. That's what we look like today, and we are called to bring an end to that. So hear me when I say this. Let us be willing to bear the hurts and the hardships and the scars that following Jesus might bring so that not only do we receive something glorious out of it, but we give that same thing to others. We can bring that life of promise from Christ, not just to ourselves, but to those who need it most. Let us live like Jesus so that the world might come to know him through the way that we treat one another. Let each one of us this week do justice. Let us show God's love and provide mercy to all people so that we can begin to change the world now and bring about that promised kingdom of God to the place we live today. This is not something we have to, to wait until we die for, to meet God in eternity and have the perfect life. Guys, Jesus is telling us that the kingdom of God starts here. So let's play our roles and bring about that kingdom here and now, huh? It's going to take work, and it's going to take all of us. So let's be Jesus to the world. Amen? Thank you so much for joining us on today's Community Cast. We hope that you were blessed by today's conversation. If you'd like to know more about Community Brookside, please feel free to visit us at our website, communitybrookside.com, or find us on your favorite social media outlet. We hope to hear from you soon. Be blessed.